Hi everyone, I just wanted to give you a, a short intro to chapter 14 um, in place of our class this evening. So I'll um, try and make this relatively brief and if you have any questions, as always, let me know. Um, you can send me an email, use the remind messaging or um, talk to me the next time we meet in class. But we're not going to meet in class for a couple of weeks. So um, I hope things are going well just in terms of announcements. Uh, we're on chapter 14 this week that starts today. Um, your papers were due last night, um, part three. If you haven't done that, there's the two-day grace period that you've had before, um, so they won't be counted late until I start grading them on Saturday. And I hope to get those grades posted relatively quickly compared with the others. Um, this one, unlike some of the other papers, um, is more um, creative on your part. <clears throat> so um, the grading rubric for it uh, makes it go just a little bit more quickly for me, um, as long as it has the required components in it. So. Um, well, get those in if you haven't already. I'm looking forward to reading those this weekend and getting all caught up in grades before we um, head into the uh, Thanksgiving break um, because the rest of the semester is going to go lickety split. Um, so chapter 14 talks about psychological disorders. It's hard to talk about disorders without also talking about their treatments, um, but that's what we're going to do. Um, so just keep in mind that you can flip back and forth between chapters 14 and 15 and look at the treatments for some of these disorders if they're of particular interest to you. Um, the American Psychiatric Association um, has a definition for a disorder. Um, and one thing that I want students, and I always point out to students, want students to think about at the beginning of this is, um, as you read through this, you will have symptoms of many of the disorders. Um, and that is typical, right? Um, it's not a disorder until it meets the threshold for a disorder, but many of these uh, symptoms are things that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. So don't be surprised um, and don't necessarily self-diagnose or don't self-diagnose yourself um, unless you're qualified to do so. And I, I, you know, I'm not qualified to diagnose disorders. That's not my area of psychology. Um, but I do know a fair amount about them, at least enough to, um, to keep going through the first couple of years of college uh, coursework. Um, so what is a psychological disorder? When we talk about disorders this way, um, we're talking about them using a medical model. And that has both benefits and drawbacks. The benefits of a medical model is, um, for one thing, we can di we, you know, we diagnose it and we can use health insurance to pay for treatments for it. So if it's a disorder, um, it, you know, it's, it's health insurance eligible. The other thing about a disorder is that if you have a disorder, then you know that it's something out there and it's not you necessarily. And it's something that you have, not something that you are. Um, so to say you have um, a panic disorder or you have an anxiety disorder rather than you're an anxious person. Um, we've done that with autism as well. We don't talk about somebody as being autistic. We talk about them as having autism. And so that removes the, the blaming the victim part of it. And so that's a benefit of the medical model. Um, one of the drawbacks about the medical model, though, is it suggests that we can cure it, right? If there's a disease, there must be a cure, and that's not always the case. There are some psychological disorders that we can cure. Um, uh, specific phobias are one. Um, not in all cases can they be cured, but, but by and large, they can be cured. It doesn't mean they always are. Um, a lot of them can be treated and treated well um, with medications, with therapy, and a number of other um, sort of environmental supports. Um, some of them cannot be treated well um, and cannot be cured. And those are the ones that are the thornier ones that to, to deal with. So um, having that medical model suggests that we have a treatment for it and we don't always have a treatment for it. Um, and I think you've probably seen the use of medications that were developed for one thing, perhaps epilepsy, being used for another, um, another sort of a disorder or another medical condition. Um, and what they found is they'll find a, a medication and it's like, oh, by the way, it also seems to work on this other thing. Let's prescribe it, you know, off label for this other thing. And so, you know, again, I'm not an expert on medications. You would need a psychiatrist with a medical degree to be an expert on that and to be able to prescribe those medications. Um, but we will talk about them as we go through and, and particularly in chapter 15 when we talk about treatments. Um, in order for something to qualify as a disorder, it needs to meet those thresholds. Um, so it needs to be deviant from the norm. So it needs to deviate from the norm in a significant way. Um, so if your behavior is just a little bit odd or a little bit different than what other people do, not yours, but somebody's, um, then it might not deviate you know, in, a, in a major way. 
Um, so it needs to be, the behavior needs to be deviant. It needs to cause the person distress or discomfort, or it would if they were aware of it. Sometimes people are, um, have a psychological disorder that's so severe that they're not aware of their own reality. Um, but if they were, it would cause them distress. And the third one is that it's dysfunctional or maladaptive in some way. It prevents you from, um, from sort of going through the activities of daily living, um, and, and it disrupts your, you know, it prevents you from going to work or socializing with other people or doing the kinds of things that you would expect people to do. Now, the model that's in the slides, and I think it's in your book, I know it was in a previous edition of the book, um, says it, it's a circle and there's a, there's a line down the middle, and on one side it's normal, you know, and then towards the middle you get over, across the middle, and it's abnormal, right? And so abnormal behavior is deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional or maladaptive. Normal behavior is not. The difficulty, though, is when you're one dot over the line, do you have the disorder or do you have to be way over the line? And so that's where the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual comes into play. It's a big fat book um, and it's got the, um, the criteria for diagnosing the disorder. Um, and it will say things like, you need to have had these symptoms for at least six months and the following things need to have happened. And so there are a number of diagnostic criteria. And once you meet the threshold, maybe you have to have three out of six or four out of six, then you're diagnosed as having the disorder. Um, and again, you might have some anxiety, but you might not have an anxiety disorder because you don't, have, you don't meet all the criteria for a certain amount of time at a certain level of severity, and it's preventing you from, um, from carrying on your life the way that you want to. Um, so, um, you, know, they're, they're, you know, when we go to um, sort of drawing the line between normal and abnormal, um, you know, it, it, it varies from, from one psychological disorder to another. Some are more common in adults, some are more common in adolescents, some more common in men, some more common in women. Um, and, you know, so you know, as you go through, sort of keep in mind um, all of those things as you're reading about the different disorders. When we talk about disorders, we need to look at four things. Um, what caused the disorder? So if you have the disorder, and I think a lot of times it's interesting to think about it as if you had it so that you would know how you would like it to be treated. So I'm not suggesting that any of you have a disorder. Um, but if I have a disorder, I want to know what caused it. Um, what's the etiology of that? What are the things that caused it? Was it a biological cause? Was it an environmental cause? Um, what was the thing that caused the disorder? Um, what are the symptoms? What I was just talking about. What are the symptoms of the disorder? You know, do you have those symptoms and in what severity? Um, you would like somebody to be able to diagnose it and say you either have it or you don't and which one you have. Um, and we have uh, a concept called comorbidity. Um, very often people um, meet the, if they meet the criteria for a disorder, they may meet the criteria for more than one disorder. So they may meet the criteria for major depression and another disorder or anxiety and another disorder and that's what we call comorbidity. Um, and then what's your prognosis, right? What is the treatment for it? Um, for depression, it might be cognitive behavioral therapy. It might be an, taking an antidepressant. And uh, there are different categories of antidepressants. There are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that we talked about when we talked about chapter two in the brain, about how we could keep more serotonin available in the brain. Um, but there are other types of antidepressants as well. And what presents um, on the outside as major depression may have different underlying causes. So the drug or the treatment that works for one person may not work for the other person because they have the symptoms of major depression, but they have different underlying causes of it. And unless you're treating those underlying causes properly, you're not going to get the, um, the relief um, and the cure or the treatment that you were hoping to get. Um, causes of disorders, there are a couple of different ways we can think of them. Um, one is that you might, may have a biological or some sort of a risk factor for biological or environmental risk factor for a disorder. That doesn't necessarily mean you'll get the disorder. Um, you may also need some sort of a stress trigger for that disorder. And so that's the diathesis stress, stress model. Um, the biopsychosocial model says, look, there are biological factors that we're only, well, I won't say we're only starting to understand. We have been understanding them and our understanding continues to increase as our research on the brain continues to get more and more conclusive and go into different areas and we can understand more. We have more powerful tools. 
Um, so uh, understanding what's going on in the brain would be the biological part. Also the genetic um, vulnerability to it, um, how illnesses um, like, uh, for instance, the flu or you know, some other illness may trigger something. Um, the psychological ones, you know, how do, you know, what are the, you know, what are the impacts um, that are psychological and then social, you know, what kind of an environment are you in? Um, what is your family life like? Um, how are emotions expressed in your family? Um, and does that or does that not exacerbate what you're doing? So looking at all of those factors to try and understand what's going on with a particular person. Um, um, methods of assessment uh, for disorders. Uh, we can ask people, you know, uh, sometimes people seek treatment um, and they will tell you what's going on with them. Sometimes we observe people who need treatment um, and they may not be aware of it. Um, we can interview people, we can test people um, with psychological tests, with biological tests, um, and a number of things. So, um, you know, again, with many of these disorders, um, they fall somewhere on a continuum and, you know, the difference between normal and abnormal can be a fine line. And so we sometimes look for people who are way over the line um, before we will diagnose a, a particular constellation of symptoms as being um, a particular disorder. Okay, um, uh, the book goes through different categories of, of disorders. So there are anxiety disorders that are talked about, um, specific phobias, um, social anxiety. Um, I don't know about you, but many people have um, anxiety a fear of public speaking, you know, if they're if they know that they're going to have to give a speech in front of their class or a speech in front of an auditorium, um, or you know, speak in, in in any formal or informal setting, they may have social anxiety. That's typical. But if it prevents you from getting out of bed and actually going to school, then that might be one of the criteria for a social anxiety disorder. Um, so again, it needs to be um, deviant. It needs to be distressful to you and maladaptive or or dysfunctional in some way. Um, so the anxiety disorders uh, are well described in the book. Um, then, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, there's a, an assignment this week um, to read about um, post-traumatic growth. Um, and I want to just highlight there, um, post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder. You've heard about it, I'm sure. You'll read about it more in the book. Um, there is a flip side to that. There's a flip side to stress that, that offers you an opportunity for personal growth. I want to be very careful, though, to highlight that we shouldn't blame the victim. If somebody is suffering from PTSD, we should not single them out and say, hey, you should be growing from this. Why aren't you doing better? Um, not everybody is capable of that. Not every circumstance will lend itself to that. Um, but I just wanted people to know that there is an opportunity to think about it differently sometimes. Um, and if you can think about it differently, try and think about what has been gained um, and how you might um, maximize and, and capitalize on those gains rather than um, what is lost. There are also a number of new and innovative treatments, and it's a source of continuing research, um, the treatment for PTSD. Again, you'll see more about that in chapter 15. I had to count back between 14 and 15. Um, then um, depressive disorders um, talks about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, surprisingly, um, is a really small portion of the population. But if you look at um, literature, if you look at movies, if you look at um, you know, news, popular media, um, you see a lot of reports of schizophrenia. And so um, schizophrenia is one that we can't treat very well um, and we definitely can't cure, at least at this time. Um, it is, um, it, it, it's more evident, right? So when somebody has it, when they have voices, you know, if you can imagine listening to me and listening to another conversation in your head all the time, and I'm talking to you while you're trying to think about doing something else, how disruptive that would be. Um, the symptoms of, of schizophrenia are just um, incredibly uh, difficult to deal with. Um, although you also find people who suffer from schizophrenia who don't wanna take the medications because the side effects of the medications are also pretty significant. Um, and so, for some people who, who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, they consider schizophrenia part of who they are and that the medications or the treatments make them somebody who they're not. Um, and so, you know, there are always, you know, those kinds of issues to take. There's also a question, and, you know, this can come up in various areas of the book. Um, if somebody has committed a crime and is suffering from a major psychological disorder and we can medicate them out of that, if they go on trial, should they go to trial? Should they be required to take the medication 
so that they can participate in their own defense. And the benefit there is they can participate in their own defense. The drawback there is what the jury is seeing is the person under medication and able to participate. Um, and perhaps when they committed the crime, they were not on the medication and not fully aware of their own actions. And you as a juror might judge them differently based on your perceived capacity of what they could understand and how much of their behavior they could control. Not trying to excuse criminal behavior in any way, just trying to understand um, the different factors, what we would consider mitigating factors, so that when you're sentencing somebody, do you sentence them to the maximum amount of incarceration? Do you sentence them to a combination of, combination of incarceration and treatment? Or do you, uh, do you sentence them to a tr treatment facility from which they are not free to leave, but it is you know, largely a treatment facility? So um, again, you know, if you're interested in psychology and these last few chapters speak to you, um, Psychology 281, Abnormal Psychology, would be the next course to take where you could really do a deep dive on different disorders and their treatments. Um, okay, so that's it. Um, also, I want to mention that schizophrenia does have a strong biological component and also seems to need a environmental trigger. Um, schizophrenia is one of those things that um, if you are vulnerable to it, um, it tends to emerge in early adulthood. Um, so you rarely see it in children um, and you rarely see it for the first time in, uh, in middle adulthood and later. Um, you typically see it in early or emerging adulthood, um, and you know you can read more about that in the book. Okay, um, uh, other disorders. Um, I, you know, I wish we had more time. I would love to talk about dissociative disorders and dissociative identity disorder, which we used to call multiple personality disorder. Um, I'll just highlight for you that um, a lot of people don't think it's a thing. Um, and when they say I don't think it's a thing, it doesn't mean that it doesn't present as multiple personalities, but uh, if you are role playing and you are finding a way to think about Halloween, um, if you put on a Batman uh, costume and you go out and everybody, all they see is a Batman mask and you're Batman, you have the freedom to act differently than you would in your day to day life because you are Batman for a minute. And you can do things that you might want to do and say things in a way that you might want to say them, or at least try it out. And so when you think about dissociative identity disorder, consider the fact that the person may be taking on different roles, um, but it isn't necessarily the presence of different people uh, within them, and it may or may not be within their control. Um, some of the very high profile cases that have been in the media and there have been books and movies about um, have been retracted later, uh, where the person said, um, I, you know, my, my, my therapist was encouraging me to take on these different roles to deal with these different problems in my life, and it, it just sort of got out of hand, and I was, uh, I was participating in this dialogue with my, uh, with my therapist, um, but I also was aware of what I was doing, um, and so that's not always the case. I'm by no means an expert in um, you know, all the cases of dissociative identity disorder, uh, but just keep that in mind. The last thing I want to wrap up with is um, diagnosing disorders in children is incredibly difficult. Um, and many of the disorders that are diagnosable in adulthood are not diagnosable in children. Children can be fanciful. Children can take an idea and run with it. Um, children, as you know, have a response bias. So it, for the very youngest children, if you show an interest in what they're doing, they tend to do more of that thing. Um, and that makes diagnosing children very difficult. Does not mean that we don't diagnose them or that we shouldn't diagnose them. There are children that are incredibly troubled um, and uh, almost to the point that you wonder whether it could have had any environmental uh, cause or whether it's all biological. And so there's a lot of research on how to diagnose, how to treat, how to prevent psychological disorders in children to the extent that we can. I don't know about prevention, I probably misspoke there, but um, definitely a lot of research on um, diagnosing and treating and understanding the causes. Um, and so maybe that's where prevention comes in. If you knew what the cause was and there was some intervention that you could do that would make that cause, that, uh, that biological cause less likely to happen, um, then you could do that. Okay, so longer than I meant for it to be. Um, have a great week. And uh, if you've got any questions, let me know. We will meet again after Thanksgiving. Um, at some point in the next week or so, I will post a study guide for the final exam so that you can bring any questions that you have to that last meeting. Um, and then I've posted in Blackboard at the very top. So 
all of the announcements after that come in just below it, but there's one that's pinned at the top that's got the final exam information about it. Please don't ask me how many questions there are, or what kind of questions there are, because I haven't written it yet. Um, but as soon as I know, you'll know. Well, I'll know first. Um, but uh, the, the next time we meet after I have finished writing the exam, I will let you know. I write a new exam every semester or so, um, so that it so that it's consistent with what we've talked about and learned about in the class and focused on in the class. As you've seen, psychology is a super wide field. Um, we can't cover everything, and so I want to make sure that um, we've covered some important things, and I hope that you're finding it meaningful. So have a great week, um, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.